The following program is sponsored by generous friends and partners of Real Life. It's not a good day when you share with a religious leader, a pastor, a priest, or a pope, and you say, well, you know what? I, I, I bit the cat. And they, and, and they go, you what? How could you? That's weird. Because Jesus said, and Paul says, those who don't, who don't know me, they do the same thing. So I've never done that. Did you think about it? In the message, Plank Eye, Jack Hibbs explains why our responsibility is to examine our own heart and leave the judging to God. Does it really take a village to raise a child or does it simply start at home? Drawing from their own inspiration and personal experiences, Jack and Lisa Hibbs co-authored the book, Turnaround at Home. This book will help you understand your emotional, spiritual, and social background, giving biblical encouragement for creating positive cycles in marriage and parenting. Like any family, Jack and Lisa had triumphs and made mistakes, but found that intentional parenting was the key. With over 50 practical ideas for parents, such as godly families begin with godly marriages. Raising godly children is a parent's mandate and responsibility. How to discipline in a godly family and the importance of prayer in a family. Order the book, Turn Around at Home, to help you make changes for good and equip yourself to provide a stronger spiritual legacy. Perfect for parents, grandparents, or a gift for parents-to-be. Order your copy today. Well, I want to welcome you to today's program, and I've got to tell you, if it wasn't so serious, it would be hilarious. I know that almost sounds kind of irreverent, but let me explain. Jesus is going to be speaking to us. The Word of God is going to be telling us as we study in the book of Romans, we're looking at this thing of judgment and judging and, and us laying burdens upon people to meet our standards. When we look at the Word of God and Jesus speaks to us about the spirit of judgment that we hold in our human hearts, that we look at others and we point that fault out, we become sin sniffers and fault finders, and if you only knew, and oh, that person, and what a hypocrite they are. And Jesus says in the Sermon on the Mount that you're really somebody walking around with a plank in their eye. I mean, isn't that amazing? God in flesh would do a hyperbole that he would do a sanctified exaggeration that the person who's critical might have a little speck in the eye. You know how that irritates you, like sand in the eye? Jesus says, oh no, it's way beyond that. It is a plank. I mean, I see somebody blinking and you can see this two by four um, moving, coming out of their eyeball. It's ridiculous. It's insane. And that's exactly the picture he wants you to have regarding you and I assuming the spot of authority over somebody's life. We're going to be judging them based on our standard. Frankly, the Bible says, how dare you? How can you when there's a plank in your own eye? We want to make sure that as believers that we walk before him always aware of our own spiritual health with Jesus. How are we doing? with Jesus, and we need not judge ourselves with others. Not a good thing to do. Matthew chapter seven, verse one, listen to this. Judge not, that's the word condemn. 
See, we see the word judge not, and we say, you can't tell me. You can't. Hey, it's none of your business what I'm doing over here, this, that, and the other. Oh, yes, it is. No, the Bible says, judge not. No, the Bible says here, Matthew 7, 1, condemn not. We have no authority. It is not to us. Judge not or condemn not that you be not condemned. For with what judgment you judge, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. And you do, and why do you look at the speck, a speck like a grain of sand, you know, in your brother's eye, but do not consider the plank that is in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, let me remove the speck from your eye, and look, a plank is in your own eye? hypocrites. <laughs> That's Jesus. He's so subtle. <laughs> First remove the plank from your own eye and then you will be able to see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. Is that graphic? Can you imagine this guy coming up and he's got this two by four in his eye and he's going, you got something wrong with you. <laughs> That's how God sees this. Right, we look really amazing on the outside. It's like wow, and then God, but God, you, God's glasses—it's like you know, like infrared vision. He puts his glasses on. You go, man, a plank sticking out of that guy's face, <laughs> and he's telling that guy that he's got a problem with his speck. What Jesus saying? He's saying that there's a difference about being personal with God versus religious with God. Amen. Matthew chapter seven, verse fifteen: Beware of false prophets, and we'll throw in false teachers as well, right? Who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravenous wolves. You will know them by their fruits. Amen. Do men gather grapes from thorn bushes? What's the answer to that? No. Do you get figs from thistles? No. Nope. Even so, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a bad tree bear good fruit. Verse 19, every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Therefore, by their fruits, you will know them. It's very simple. It's very clear, very direct. Matthew chapter 7, verse 21. Matthew 7, 21. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven. But he who does the will of my Father in heaven, many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied or proclaimed, preached? It doesn't mean tell the future. It means didn't we preach in your name? Didn't we give messages? Didn't we cast out demons in your name? And done many wonders or miracles in your name? Don't you think if you saw that stuff happening, you'd think, wow, that person's going to be somebody in heaven, right? Imagine if somebody, imagine if you saw somebody preaching, performing miracles, doing all these things. Wouldn't you in our psyche just kind of automatically say, wow, Jesus just blows that up. Verse 23, and then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Therefore, whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, I will liken on him as a wise man who built his house on a rock. Is that powerful? Yes. It's so quiet in here because we're convicted. I call Jesus Lord. I prophesy. I preach. I'm not sure if I've ever cast the demon out of anybody. I don't think I've ever raised anybody. No, I'm pretty sure I have not raised anybody from the dead. <laughs> But you, you think of those things as assets. Can you imagine? Uh, you're, a, you're a pastor applying for a, a new job at a church. And, and what can you say about yourself? I, I've prophesied in Jesus' name. Uh, he is my Lord, Lord, Lord. Right? Uh, raised a couple of dead people. And cast out some demons. And the person... If they're not thinking, they would say, oh, you're hired. <laughs> but if they are thinking, they would say, let me get back to you. I'm going to pray a little longer on this. Why? Because that means nothing. Jesus is talking about a reality. Is it a reality that Jesus Christ is the Lord of your life? 
not some law, not some rules, not some church or religion or denomination. 2 Corinthians 13, 5 through 7 says there, uh, examine yourselves to see if your faith is genuine. Test yourselves. Surely you know that Jesus Christ is among you. If not, you have failed the test of genuine faith. That's terrifying to think about. The legalist versus those who truly know God. I wrote down a little checklist here. Let's see if it works. It worked this morning, very early in the morning. Let's see if it works now. In my personal experience, the legalists are prolific hypocrites. I've watched them over the years. That's one, one thing great about being a Christian for decades upon decades is you begin to see things and you see things fall into patterns. Um, and I wrote this down. I hope it doesn't offend you, but it's just in my head because I think Chuck Smith said it years ago. And so the legalist will say things like this. Um, they'll tell you not to uh, smoke, drink, or chew. Young people don't know what that means. That's chew tobacco. Don't smoke, drink, or chew, or go out with girls who do. <laughs> and that was the rule. And they're very quick to point that out. And more. They will, listen, the legalists will lay burdens on you. I want you to think right now, any religion that says, now, for you to get better in your situation, you need to do these things. The moment that, are you listening, church? Yes. The moment anyone of religious standing says, for you to get better with us and God, you need to do these things. Here, let me, let me just give you a little thing here, and you just come back in a week when you're done. And we'll just make sure you get bumped up the God list. I can't believe you did that. What? It's not a good day when you share with a religious leader, a pastor, a priest, or a pope, and you say, well, you know what? I, I, I bit the cat. And they, and, and they go, you what? How could you? That's weird. Because Jesus said, and Paul says, those who don't, who don't know me, they do the same thing. You say, I've never done that. Did you think about it? The second thing I've observed in life is that you never feel loved by them. You never feel secured after talking to them. You never feel uplifted or edified. You don't get instruction from them. You don't get correction. You don't get guiding. That leaves you desiring God more. When you meet with them, you desire God less. You put your head down, you walk away. Defeated. Jesus is never in that. Can you all hear me? Yes. He's not in it. Amen. He will speak to you and he will encourage you. And listen, no matter who you might be today, and if you've committed some horrible sin, you know what he's saying to you? He's saying to you right now, give it to me, give it to me. Give it to me. Hand it to me. Even those who are addicted to something. You know what he's saying to you? Hand it to me. And you're saying, I don't, I can't, I can't. Give it to me. Just hand it, put it in my hand. And you're, you're terrified because you know that the withdrawal is going to be brutal. Let him mitigate the withdrawal. Let him take care of the withdrawal. Whatever it is, religion will say, how could you? Go away from me. Jesus says, give it to me. It's like he takes it because he takes the wound of it. Mm. Only he can do it. Listen, he's the only one qualified to reach out and say, give it to me. You want to know why? Because 2,000 years ago, he felt it at the cross. Mm. And so now, think of it. He's saying to you, are you addicted to that drink? Are you addicted to that drug? Are you addicted to that porn? Are you addicted to that violence? Are you addicted to fill in the blank? He's saying, just give it to me. Just give it to me. He's that good. The scripture here goes on and he announces to us that regarding you and I and his righteousness, 
that you and I are to live in the light. He goes on in verse one, for you who judge practice the same things. We don't need to belabor this. They are not walking in the light. The Bible is very clear about this. The word practice, look at it. In fact, it should be on the screen. Uh, the word practice means to attend to it. Those who practice these sins, they attend to it. Those who are not walking with God, they give their thoughts to it. Jesus said in John 8, 36, therefore, if the son makes you free, you shall be free indeed. In Galatians chapter 6, verse 7 through 10, listen to this, Galatians 6, verses 7 through 10, the Bible says, don't be deceived, don't trick yourself, God's not mocked, nothing gets pulled over his eyes, for whatever a man sows, that will he also reap, for he who sows to his flesh will of the flesh reap corruption, Listen to this, but he who sows to the spirit will of the spirit reap everlasting life. I'll come back to that in a second. And let us not grow weary uh, while doing good for in due time, uh, in due season, we shall reap if we do not lose heart. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all, especially those who are the household of faith, especially those who are um, in your vicinity, your brothers and sisters in Christ. When that verse there says, uh, so to the spirit, what does that mean? Uh, this is so liberating. This is so the sun setting you free. As a believer, if I choose to not do the things that I should do regarding strengthening my life for the day, whatever that is, I just... Don't, I just don't do it. I go into almost a state of neutral, and it's not good. Number two, if I'm a believer, and I do not invest in the things spiritually in my life, but in the flesh, and those things are sinful, I start out in a gross negative, right? I'm still a Christian, but it's tough going. Third, if I choose to walk in the Spirit, what can I expect? To walk in the Spirit is to, when he says, so do the things of the Spirit, it is to invest yourself in the things of God. It's very simple. We make it a big deal, but it's very simple. So we read a moment ago that those who practice those things but do them, or they do them, they practice them, and they say you shouldn't, this is, this is walking in the Spirit. I, watch, are you ready? Don't miss it. Do you have your attention? Yes. Here it is. I'm going to walk in the Spirit. Dear Lord, please don't let me become so polished as a Christian that I'm tempted to become almost professional at being a Christian, so routine, so ho-hum about it all, that there's no dynamic there's no thrill at being a Christian. I play it safe. God, don't let me play it safe. Don't let me sow to the flesh. Because if I let my Christianity grow dull, now, if that's growing dull, then the things of the world begin to sparkle. Ooh, did you see that? Ooh, did you see the other? So, Lord, please don't let me do that. Rather, Lord, I'm asking you to attend to my mind. I'm asking you to take the word that I just read a moment ago about this person who condemns others, but they themselves entertain such evils. Lord, don't let my mind go down that road. And so, Jesus, as I go now to live my day, I'm going to ask you, please, now, keep ever before me your presence. Let me keep me, make me walk in your light. Amen. And, and you, that's it. What I just showed you just now begins the day of walking in the spirit. And we can all do this. And I trust you do. When you and I do things that are not honoring to God, we are obviously not walking in the spirit. And to walk in the spirit is not some mystical glow. No, to walk in the spirit is to make a decision. I'm not going to condemn people. 
I'm not going to waste my time making that decision. It's ill, it's wrong, it's sin. Rather, I'm going to decide to walk with him. So who do I think I am? I'm a forgiven child of God who is, in this world, still a sinner. Yet the process of my final sanctification has not yet come. Oh, he's sanctifying you and I every day, is he not? He's working on us and he's talking to us and he's showing us. But the final sanctification, that final act, is the moment you and I transition out of this world and into the kingdom that we're longing for and desiring, his kingdom, his world, his government, his rule. It's absolutely awesome to think. So the question is, is the kingdom in you? If the kingdom of Christ is in you, you can sit here and hear a message like this today and say, yep, yep, well, mm -hmm." if God's kingdom is awaking you, you can see and say to yourself, I need to get this taken care of. I need to take this to Christ. I need to be right with him. And that is so very liberating. I think it's absolutely awesome that if we would stop and think for a moment about religion, a lot of young people today are turned off by religion. I get it. I'm with them on that. In fact, Jesus himself spoke against organized religion more than anybody else in the scriptures. If you want to pause and study on that, Jesus stressed relationship. And listen, when you enter into a relationship with him, what are we talking about? We're talking about what he said. The kingdom of God is within you. In other words, God operates in the area of actual, real relationship, life in the spirit. Look around this world. The authorities and the powers, the the dominions, the broker of, of deals, all to manipulate all to strongholds, all to power brokers. And Jesus says, no, it's none of that stuff. It's not some earthly kingship. It's not some parliament. It's not some president. It's about the kingdom of God literally dwelling within you. So friends, listen, this is why Christianity, true biblical Christianity, uh, should not be qualified as a religion. It really shouldn't. I get it with Islam. I get it with Judaism. But Christianity is not some external outward thing. Of course, it manifests itself outwardly, but that's not the genesis of it. The genesis of Christianity is the kingdom of God, either living or not inside of you. Is Christ dwelling on the throne of your life? And that's a hard issue. And that's why Jesus said you must be born again to enter the kingdom of heaven. You must be born, the word means a second time, or born from above. Why? Because you're on the throne of your life right now. What needs to happen is for you to step off the throne of your life and say, Jesus, take the throne. Take charge. I give you the authority. That's why when he preached the gospel, when he went out with his disciples 2,000 years ago, he announced to them, the kingdom of God is near you. But then he explained that the kingdom of God dwells in you. And that's the question you must ask yourself today, friend. Are you a member of a church and that's what you think is going to get you to heaven? Is it because you attend a mosque or a synagogue that you're going to go to heaven? Jesus says, the Bible says, no way. The fact is, have you opened up your heart to invite Christ into your life? And the Bible says, he'll move into you He'll take residence by the Holy Spirit and that precious work of the Holy Spirit will begin and God will change you from the inside out, not like religion that tries to change you from the outside in. No, God goes to the heart. God goes to the source. Will you let him do that? I hope you do that. I hope you open up your heart and your life to accept the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. If you want to know more about that, we're here to help you. At jackhibbs.com, we want to be able to give you information. There's a lot of other teachings. There's a lot of other materials there. 
all of that to bring you into a closer walk with Jesus. That's why we exist. That's why we're here. And that's why we're reaching out to you. JackHibbs.com and you'll find more resources there. Does it really take a village to raise a child? Or does it simply start at home? Drawing from their own inspiration and personal experiences, Jack and Lisa Hibbs co-authored the book, Turnaround at Home. This book will help you understand your emotional, spiritual, and social background, giving biblical encouragement for creating positive cycles in marriage and parenting. Like any family, Jack and Lisa had triumphs and made mistakes, but found that intentional parenting was the key. With over 50 practical ideas for parents, such as godly families begin with godly marriages. Raising godly children is a parent's mandate and responsibility. How to discipline in a godly family and the importance of prayer in a family. Order the book, Turn Around at Home, to help you make changes for good and equip yourself to provide a stronger spiritual legacy. Perfect for parents, grandparents, or a gift for parents-to-be. Order your copy today. Welcome to Real Life Radio with Jack Hibbs. God's Word never will return void. God's Word is spirit, it's power, and it has its effect. So I want to encourage you to grab your Bibles, open them up, and get ready to learn from God's Word. God did not give us Bible prophecy to scare us, but to prepare us. But I think you're going to get a lot out of it, and one of the great reasons You are the light of the world, Jesus said. You are the salt of the earth. How does that happen? By the power of the Holy Spirit. You're going to get excited about what Jesus Christ wants to do in and through you. Jack Hibbs truly believes we are living in some of the most exciting days in history which brings some great opportunities to share with the world a powerful, no-nonsense presentation of the gospel to this generation who are searching for answers and truth. Will you stand with us in sharing this message in real and practical ways? We ask that you commit to support Real Life and the teachings of Jack Hibbs with a gift of your choosing. Simply go to jackhibbs.com. And there, you can simply follow the instructions of how to give a one-time gift or a recurring gift. If you would prefer to call, our toll-free number is 877-777-2346. Again, that's 877-777-2346. And of course, you can write us. Our address is Real Life with Jack Hibbs, Box 1273, Chino Hills, California, 91709. Your gift will be faithfully put to work because it's our desire that through Jesus Christ, you will know real life. The preceding program was sponsored by generous friends and partners of Real Life.